is Carrie Lavalley. My pronouns are she, her. I am a filmmaker. I work primarily in fiction, docu-realism, but I'm also a writer and director. Um, and I am the writer and director of Partners in Crime. Hi, as well. I'm Dani. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm a filmmaker. Um, I do scenarios. I direct, I edit, and um, I'm trying to start producing too. I just uh, registered my company to uh, the government of Quebec, so I'm hoping that this will lead somewhere. Did you shoot this film in your later kind of tenure at college or at university, or was this more in your first? I took my last year at university. How did you make yours? Both Playhouse and Partners in Crime, were you were you um, at school or was it outside of it or? Yeah, I, I got a film fellowship right after I graduated from college. So I was very fortunate in that way. And I made Playhouse, which screened at Nifty in 2018. And that's kind of, once I finished Creative Culture and I was in Sundance Ignite, I kind of was able to use both my communities in Make Partners in Crime, that's kind of how it happened. It was hard to do while also having a full-time job, but we did it, we made it, we got our goal, which was so great. And then we had a few like EPs come onto the movie and it, that, was, that was a learning experience for sure renting new equipment, kind of like at, at film school, you know, at, in creative culture, you, you were able to rent out a camera and all your other equipment through the program. So you didn't have to pay, but you know, we were shooting with a, an Alexa mini for partners in crime. So, you know, that comes with a cost. <laughs> it's great to have the, this equipment and it makes you feel like maybe more professional and more, but you're, you're not necessarily it but it's just like it gives you the kick you need to, I don't know, feel at the right spot, I guess. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you, you definitely don't have to have the most expensive cutting edge camera to have a great film. You know, if your story is sound and your, and your sound is of good quality, that you're, you're doing fine. That's also kind of the, the perk of having friends who own their own cameras. You're like, can I perhaps rent this from you for a very yeah. cheap price? <laughs> As opposed to a rental house where you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then you're competing with everyone else that has like real budgets. Talking about sound, I, I had to say that like in both your films, sound was really good. I was really impressed with that. I, I was so particular about sound for partners in crime because the film and, and with Playhouse because they're such silent nonverbal films mm. and they space is such a character as it is naturally in those films and you know the quality of sound can impact so many things um, and with partners in crime you know it was supposed to be in the summer and we were trying to like incorporate cicada sounds and the sounds of the suburbs and specifically in Schenectady and like placed and it is shot in my hometown in Schenectady, New York. And so trying to be specific with the sounds of Schenectady was really important for me um, in building a soundscape. And it was actually the first time I worked with a sound designer or he was instrumental in, in creating that atmosphere and helping build tension in places and, and in building vulnerability in places that is outside of my own skill set. And so I think like he really added a finesse to the film that wouldn't be if he wasn't there. So I'm, I'm very grateful for him and, and what he did for us. But talking about nonverbal and kind of like physical intimacy, I really want to talk about your film because I, I myself am a fan of nonverbal life. So I feel like there's such a genuine kind of interaction between your characters and I would love to know more about how you got to that place. Uh, what did you do to build the, the trust uh, within yourself and with your, with your actors? It was kind of funny, the, the casting of that movie, because I wasn't yet ready to work with professional actors. I didn't feel like confident enough in myself to go and like, ask someone professional to come in on my set. So the character Ode that has like brown hair, um, she was with me through every movies I've made before. So mm -hmm. in my second year in, in university, she was my, my main character. 
And then I just asked her to come back because we had this like very deep understanding of one another. It was very easy to communicate and to communicate how I was feeling. And she's a very smart actress. So like uh, she does improv. So we really were working with what she was able to do. Oh, that was like more volubile, we say in French. It's, um, she was more of a speaker. She, she had most of the lines. And then the two other girls, Clara and the other Camille, that were, that were artists or a dancer. I was like, it would be easier for you to just work with movement because it's easier to, I think it's easier to feel in place like if you have something to do. I think one of the worst thing you can do to an actor is like give them lines and not give them direction on how to move or how to interact with the space. So yeah, we were really working with that. What was the first project that made you fall in love with filmmaking? I don't think there was a project that made me fall in love with filmmaking. I think I've always known that filmmaking was going to be a part of my life in some way. And the project that made me realize that filmmaking was going to be a viable career was going to be a part of my more professional life, not just like a passion, not just simply a passion thing, but a passion and a professional thing was creative culture, really. I went to school at SUNY Purchase. I went for cinema studies and that was great. You know, I love movies, but I was in the program and I realized, wow, I really want to be making the movies. I love that I can sit here and talk about theory with you all, but at the same time, you know, I really, I'm, I'm so inspired that I literally want to get up and go do it. So I think when I was able to kind of make my own experience with filmmaking in school, I, I took some classes, some production courses, but it was pretty limited at the time. And then I got the fellowship and where I was able to kind of like really step into filmmaking as like, oh, I, I am an artist. I am a filmmaker. Like, let's get comfortable saying that, you know? And yeah. I like to say I took my first formative steps in creative culture. The first film I made in that program was called Niski Land. And it's about these two friends who are drifting apart. It was life-changing because the program itself is such a wonderful space where you can be super vulnerable and you can be at a different experience level than someone else and it's not seen as a detriment or a weakness it's just like oh, okay cool you know like let's share our experiences like let's not hold things close to the chest like let's share what what we know so everyone can have the knowledge that we may have that can help you do the things you want to do you know but what about you what is a film or a, a moment or, you know, watching a film, making a movie that you were like, wow, this is something I can see being a part of my life. I didn't want to do cinema at first because in my family, we have a big sport culture, but not a lot of culture culture. So there wasn't much music or cinema or books even in my home when I was growing up. And I loved to write, like I would always be journaling and like, writing stories from when I was seven years old. I had like my first little book that I had written that was like a story about friends in school. And like, it was really childish, but still like I had that drive to write. And then in high school, there was this teacher, an ethics teacher that also gave like extracurricular cinema classes um, to seniors. And I was in my second year, second year of high school, and he just said like, "Yeah, let me read what you have, and we'll just like I can help you improve it and everything." And once he read it, he just told me that he thought I had a cinematographic writing, mm -hmm. and he asked me to direct a zombie movie <laughs> with Ooh. like the seniors. So I was writing and directing this movie with all. The crew were seniors and I was like this little 14 year old like telling them what to do and that was just the best experience for me and I think one of the things about cinema that like got me to want to do it so much so much is the the communal feeling of it and the feeling that you're all in it together and that everyone is helping you yeah I'm just glad that it's like an experience you share making a movie even though it's yours it's your story it's you that's directing you have like everyone around you to make it happen. And I think that's the thing that made me fall in love with filmmaking at first. It's really the communal feeling of it. A great piece of advice I could give people who want to look into filmmaking as a, as a place to explore creatively or as a place you want to make a career in 
is the communal collaborative process is so integral to it. And to find a community or a space where you feel safe and to be vulnerable and you feel safe to explore certain sides of you that are very emotional and very, that are very fresh is so key because, you know, you want to feel safe when you're making art because it is so from your heart, you know, from your, from your mind, from an experience. And you want to be surrounded by people that make you feel comfortable and challenging yourself to make your films or to write your stories, but also understand that it's a very emotional process and give you the space and the grace to be like, listen, you know, we're all figuring it out together. I, I appreciate you being honest, appreciate you being vulnerable. Thank you for sharing this with us, you know, sharing your art with us and like your fears about maybe not knowing something. Like you said, we, no one knows everything, you know, like, I, I have a couple of friends who are my close collaborators. When I when I don't know something, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do here. Like, I don't know what to do. I am scared that I don't know what to do. I, I need help. And I think that is so important because if you're able to say that with people you can trust, say that people you, you feel safe with, like everyone benefits from that. Cause you're like, oh, I don't know either. But you know, and that also comes in time and building relationships. And again, you know, making sure you're around people who genuinely and sincerely feel a connection with you and into them, you know, um, how much does your own life or your own space uh, influence your films? Pretty much all of my films are inspired by things I'm living um, or things I've lived in the past. Um, but there's always this feeling, this feeling that life moves too fast for cinema. So every time I end the movie, I'm like, but I'm not there anymore. I was there when I started two years, three years ago. And I feel like sometimes, yes, it's inspired by me. And it was me at that moment when I first wrote it, but then it changes so much in the process uh, with, and it changes with me too. So I guess like even when I get to editing, I will always chop off sentences or like uh, chop off entire scenes just because it doesn't feel true to me anymore, but I very much go by instinct. So everything I do is like, I, I, I just go with how I, what I feel is best. And I think it's part of being vulnerable too is like, and not knowing things is just like going how you think it should and then getting the most authentic product or like artwork you can get. But uh, but yeah, I always write from my from my own perspective and from my own stories and what I'm writing now is like based on the community I have here. Um, and I really want to start like focusing more on things that are around me rather than only me. But I think as a starting point, for a writer starting with yourself is the best thing because once you know yourself it's much easier to understand the others around you and then write stories that can incorporate other realities yeah there's this the sentiment you know write from what you know the the advice everyone gives right but it's true i remember in film school when i when i used to watch everybody's project in the class i would always relate them like best the movies that came from the heart rather than like wanting to do this extra special shot that was like in a cinematographic way but that didn't tell anything you know a, a beautiful shot can be impactful but also you know you don't need a, a crane to make something beautiful you know i think like something that i really liked about in your film is that i think the ending shot is just sitting on one of the characters just looking at another person. And like, you know, you're getting a sense. I think those moments of pause, those moments of, that are maybe visually very simple, but they pack a lot of punch, you know? But like, so for Partners in Crime, we were referencing a bunch of films. So like, apart from Celine Siyama, I was thinking about like uh, Andrea Arnold. So a lot of, so Fish Tank and, um, American Honey. I know you mentioned that you were referencing paintings, but were there any other films or anything? Um, like a photo like a photographer, I also was really enjoying um, and love uh, is Sally Mann, and she has really beautiful photography. Uh, were there any things you were using while you were shooting outside of the paintings as a reference point? 
I, 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 I had in my mood board like uh, Bendit Like Beckham. I was rewatching it and I was like, it's actually very well shot. Like, it's actually pretty nice. And I was just like, at one point, I was at one festival and we had a QA and I just said, like, yeah, I just wanted to redeem Bend It Like Beckham because Bend It Like Beckham was supposedly a queer movie, but then it was like shut down by the producer. So I was just like, I need to redeem Bend It Like Beckham and then put it in my in inspiration, but just because. There is tension there, mm -hmm. like there is an underlying tension and... Yeah, I think that I can definitely see that as a reference to you bringing it up for your film because, I mean, better like Beckham, I love soccer, I used, I used to play soccer. Within like, what, seven seven minutes your film is, I think? Yeah. It's just, it, it does so many things uh, that I can see very clearly now as you're talking about it, the references and the, and the points. In the, in the things you're thinking about and bringing to the table for your film very clearly. Sometimes when we're starting, we don't want to chop off anything. The first movie I did before mine was like 13 minutes long and it could have been 10, easy. Mm. And I think that was one of my biggest learning curves is like when to know where to let go. Do you think your work as an editor has to do with the length of your film? I will say that it hurts to lose shots and moments that you really love, but just don't serve your film. But you're like, damn, on paper, that was amazing. And yeah. then you you shoot it and you're like, it's still really good, but it just doesn't fit in the way that the film is now um, taking shape. So yeah, I think it's definitely putting on different hats um, and having maybe a co-editor, a co-pilot in, in the cutting room because there are moments in Partners in Crime where I was like, are we sure? <laughs> Can I please? And it's just like, no, I, we, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for the movie. You know, keep it for you for later. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it is being very diplomatic, I think, at times with your shots about like, you know, something may be beautiful, something may be pretty, but again, is it serving your story? You know, it, is it driving your narrative forward? Um, and that is, a challenge when you write and direct and then have to edit your own stuff. Did you have an editor for your film or were you also an editor, the editor? Well, I always, I always do everything on it. I'm kind of a control freak. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of difficulty letting go when it comes to something I know how to do. Mm -hmm. And I actually feel that my best, um, the best parts of my filmmaking are Rather, the parts of my filmmaking that I'm more in control of are writing and editing because there is there are two sides of the same coin. But then when I get on set, I I rely on other people much more. But I always have like um, friends around me that will read or will watch where I'm going with it and tell me what they think about it. And I think that's very important because you cannot make something closed up in your own bubble. It just something might talk to you that won't talk to anybody else and it's just like you need to have somebody's output because at the end of the day cinema is a spectator's medium like you go into the room and you make what you can of what you're seeing yeah and sometimes when you edit in isolation and something makes sense to you yeah. and then you show it to someone and they're like i i'm a little confused you're like what <gasps> I have no idea. And also when you're writing, I guess that will happen to you too. Like, because you're writing something, you know the story so thoroughly that you don't, like, you don't even hesitate to think that it's understandable, but someone comes from the outside and will just like, tell you how it is. Which is good. Maybe sometimes you're just like, ah, but it's, it's definitely helpful. <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation. It was so nice getting to meet you. Yes. And I loved watching your movie. It was great. I loved watching yours too. I was like, it's very, um, it felt like two movies that went together. And I really loved like getting to see how you started and where you went. And I can't wait to see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs>